any of the real crazy stories? No, you can't do any of that, Brian Schultz. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kevin Harrington. I'm Samba Bachili. Nina Vaca, Chief Executive Officer of Pinnacle Group. An original shark from the hit TV show Shark Tank. The CEO of ADS Group. The largest Latina-owned workforce solutions in America. I first identify myself as an entrepreneur when I was 15 years old. My mother and father immigrated here with a suitcase and a dream. I had a front row seat to entrepreneurship. I am living proof of what is possible in this country. Today, the marketplace is, is very tough. The challenge for African market today is its access to capital. The number one reason why we can't scale as entrepreneurs is access to capital. What makes Globe so different and so powerful is the access to experts, gurus, mentors, coaches, financiers, venture people, money. When I started my business, I immediately went to engage with different communities, different platforms. Glow makes that experience digital. A digital platform makes it so much faster and so much easier for you to meet like-minded people. The financial pl platform that Glow have that make Glow unique. Glow is about commerce, Glow is about community, and Glow is about having access to capital. Glow is an asset to every entrepreneur in this country and globally. It's, it's about helping you take your business, your idea, to the next step. Hi there, and welcome to the Business Acceleration 2.0. It's the show where leaders go to grow. It's brought to you by the Business Finishing School, an online program to help entrepreneurs grow their business to become more profitable, scalable, sustainable, and saleable. It's also brought to you by the Global Leaders Organization, or GLOW as we call it. GLOW is a membership organization that's made for the entrepreneur. It's built on the four pillars of community, commerce, capital, and content. We're excited today. We're going to have the guest, Brian Schultz, with us. But before we bring Brian on, just a little bit of housekeeping. Number one, if you're watching on social media, be sure to like and subscribe to us. And that way you'll be notified of all of our upcoming events. And also, be sure to share this information. Help us with our mission. Our mission is to reach a million entrepreneurs and help them grow their business by 25%. So we need your help in doing that. So please share this information with every business leader and entrepreneur that you know. Also, if you've got a question for our guest today, please put it up in chat. And that way that question will get right over to us. And then finally, our VIP room. Yes, as a premium member, you will continue to be granted access into our VIP room. And if you're wondering how you get into the VIP room, you have to become a, mem a member of GLOW at the premium level. So our VIP room will carry on that conversation with our guest today, Brian Schultz. It's kind of behind closed doors. There's no recording. It's a bit more intimate. Um, and we have a lot of fun in that VIP room. So be sure to become a, a member at the premium level and you'll be granted access into the VIP room. Today, Jay Fairbrother will be hosting the VIP room. Uh, Jay is our EVP of chapters. And speaking of chapters, we've just launched a couple new chapters. We launched uh, Fort Worth with Frank Gustafson as our chapter chair. We've got Frumi Bar in Los Angeles just launching the LA chapter. And then we've got uh, Travis Hart that stepped in with our Denver, chap our Denver chapter. And then Caitlin and Adam also stepping in with our Calgary chapter. So welcome, everybody. Um, all right. So... You're here today to hear from Brian Schultz. We're going to carry on his conversation also tomorrow on the after show, on the after glow show. It's a little tricky to say after glow show with CN Aaron. CN Aaron are our Dallas chapter chairs. They host a podcast, and every day, every Friday after our Thursday event, they carry on that conversation. They talk about how you can apply some of the stuff they learn in their business and in your business. 
Um, if you're interested in being a guest on that show, raise your hand about it. It's a pretty cool podcast that they do every Friday, 10 a.m. Central Time. Okay, so without further ado, let me bring on our guest today. He is the really known as the innovator for in-theater dining or theater in, in dining in the theaters. Um, he is the CEO and founder of Look In Dining Theaters, and we're very happy to have Mr. Brian Schultz here with us today. So welcome, Brian. Hi there. There you are. <laughs> thanks, Michelle. It's great to be with you, and uh, thanks for all your hard work and uh, helping entrepreneurs around the world. Uh, it's been a lifetime effort for you, and I appreciate it so much. Oh, you're wonderful, Brian. You and I have known each other for a very long time, from the beginning, right? In the beginning, yeah, we, both won't, of we, us. we won't say how long as we get to these advanced <laughs> stages. We'll, uh, we'll we'll keep that between us. I like that idea. Um, okay, so for those that are watching that might not know who you are, um, we're going to get into your story. But tell them how you got into in theater dining. How'd that even come about for you? Yeah, you know, it, these are these are funny stories. How sometimes you end up just getting into a role or a job, but sometimes you're kind of built for it. And uh, movie theaters, storytelling, uh, food and beverage, and being of service to guests is just what I've always loved. And as I was working in what I thought was my dream job, uh, political activities, um, I saw a movie theater restaurant and had literally a love at first sight uh, experience. It was absolutely great. And I've spent really the rest of my career and the majority of my career just figuring out how I could create great stories, a platform for great service, and give a guest a, a way to just have a good time, come together, and it's evolved into all kinds of content stories. And uh, across the country, we've got, gotten the ability to really serve in so many different ways through storytelling, through being a community gathering place and setting up the entire company in a uh, kind of stakeholder model, which we call conscious capitalism. Okay, and we're gonna get into conscious capitalism a little bit later too. So um, let's go back, let's go back to that first screen. 1993, you started, you opened yeah. up your first screen. I remember that screen. I went to that theater, so I remember it well. Then you grew the business, you became the 11th largest, uh, I guess, uh, theater, chain in the country, right? And you went from, yeah. um, I think in 2019, you had raised over close to $100 million in capital for growth capital. You had over 7,000 employees and then COVID hits. And you went to from 7,000 employees down to 34. Uh, you all had to file chapter 11 due to COVID. So talk to us a little bit about that, the things you were feeling, what you were going through, because there are some entrepreneurs that are listening in today that have had that same kind of experience, but you've been, over to, over, been able to overcome that. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. But what were you feeling, Brian? How was that hitting you? You know, it was a crazy time because we had just gone through this big fundraise. You know, you start thinking, okay, now we're really gonna scale nationally. We had eight locations under uh, construction. Um, we were building every, everywhere. Everything was hitting on all cylinders. We'd just crossed $300 million in revenue. Wow. And yeah, and, and everything was just absolutely cranking. The team was great. We had the um, funds to build the team I'd always dreamed of, whether that was education, community activism, all these things. We were really in that scale mode. Um, where it really was about to take off and then COVID did hit. And unfortunately with the government closing down theaters and distribution stopping, um, we knew that this was gonna be a tough time. What made COVID even harder though as a leader is that it started off where we thought it was gonna be maybe just a couple weeks of closure. Mm -hmm. And it, it was amazing. I, I went back to, I, I journal every night and that's been one of my uh, secrets that has really helped me. Um, and I went back to that journal and I was so concerned and frustrated that we might be closed for two weeks mm. and what the impact of a, a two week closure would be and how significant that would be to our growth path and, you know, all the inconveniences and, and stresses and, you know, two weeks, two months into, you know, six months into 12 months into this kind of uh, longer extension for the industry. But going through that, 
the one thing that really kept me focused was having great values, pillars of the company, and being comfortable with being extraordinarily transparent. And as a leader, you want to know, you want to be able to let everyone else know that you have the answer. And in COVID, that just wasn't an option. So I had to feel comfortable with myself to just be transparent and say, I don't know what the answer is, but here's the best set of solutions that we can provide, um, you know, at the time. Wow. So difficult. Um, uh, as an entrepreneur, it's like your baby, right? You started that, you built it, you grew it. It becomes your baby. You filed Chapter 11, and then shortly after that, you end up walking, having to, you walk away from it. How is that? Because that is your baby. How did you do that? And what, what even made you ha have the decision that that was the thing to do? Yeah, I, I don't know that it's necessarily a decision because when you're growing at that pace, and most businesses will never have to go through this, I hope, but when you go from 300 million in revenue to zero, with a high fixed cost business, a lot of options start to evaporate pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems I think in our system is that uh, you know banking, finance, private equity has such a short-term perspective. Um, it made it very difficult for them, uh, you know, to want to ride these things out. So as the um, number of options started to contract. Um, I wasn't actually willing to do some of the things that were being requested or even required of me as it related to, um, you know, taking care of employees, different kinds of um, comp, or even working with other other stakeholders like our landlords and vendors. So I just wasn't quite willing to take some of the actions that um, seemed to be really well um, boiled into the um, restructuring process and the bankruptcy process. So um, some of these things, as much as I'd like to say these were choices that I woke up one day and said, I'm going to do this, um, your options start to fade away when you have that big of a shift. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that it was a very, when you go back and you look at your journal, which is so fabulous that you journal every day, that's such, that's great insight. Um, that's a great book one day, Brian. <laughs> uh oh, I, I was going to say 29 years of uh, journaling. It's interesting. <laughs> um, well, okay. So, you know, as, as, as the entrepreneur, you went out and raised a lot of capital. You've raised over 100 million, we know for sure. Um, I'm sure you've learned some things along the way. Capital is one of the pillars of GLOW. Can you share some of the insights of raising capital? Were there mistakes you made that you wouldn't make again? Yeah, um, in, in raising capital, I, I think there's a lot of things. And um, uh, Michelle, I'll provide for you maybe the seven steps that have been developed to maximize the value of your company and make it easier to uh, raise capital just from my you know years of learning. But at the end of the day, it was really easy to raise capital when everything was going and you're on this rocket ship. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, even at the worst part of the movie theater industry with the new company, Look Cinemas, um, it was easy to raise capital, but for different reasons. Um, when everything was on a rocket ship, it was all about them being a part of that narrative of success mm -hmm. and just riding that wave. In the post-COVID era, it was just this idea of, hey, Brian, we've known you for a long period of time. We know that you're going to figure it out and you're great at taking care of disruption, but it was really more personal relationships. Mm -hmm. And I thought that fundraising and uh, COVID for movie theaters, I mean, you have to admit it doesn't sound that appealing when all the movie theaters are closed and you don't know what distribution is gonna be and all the news stories are talking about uh, movie theaters are dead. And I created a list of my closest contacts, folks that I thought might support me. And I created a large list but honestly, in my first 13 calls, uh, everyone said yes, and then the fundraise was done. So I, I hate to make it sound simple, but it was actually based maybe a, a little bit on um, uh, you know, your husband's work, the idea of actually dropping. <laughs> he, he made the analogy in a speech one time that when you drop food dye in a bucket, yeah. <laughs> you, do it, you do it for a period of time, and nothing, nothing, nothing. Then all of a sudden, 
the whole bucket's red. Yeah. <laughs> so so I think the success in fundraising, and, and I probably butchered that, so I'll get in trouble later. But, um, <laughs> I know. That's true. You don't realize what you're but, doing. But, but it's this idea of a, a lifetime of doing the right thing, uh, making commitments, uh, having a great network, and then all of a sudden it pays off. It just kind of comes all the way around full circle. And I think the prospects now for our industry and the disruption and being able to uh, be positioned to uh, really serve our communities in an even better way it is real and super exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so staying on the topic of investors, um, do you have a way of, I mean, you've gone through your whole career. Um, I wanna go back to values too in just a second, but um, when you're looking at investors, maybe when you were first starting out thinking about the investors, how do you choose the right investors? I mean, now you've had your career and you know who to go to, but in the beginning you really didn't, right? How do you know who to go to and how do you choose the right investor? You know, I, I think in a lot of ways it was like a marriage. You want to find someone that has things that you don't. So I think one of the mistakes that a lot of my friends have made is they try to find someone that's almost identical to who they are. And I find when you're looking for investors, having complementary skills or even polarity it is the best combination. The other thing that's really important about a capital partner, their time perspective. Nothing ever happens in the time frame that you expect. It's always harder, takes a little bit longer and a little bit more expensive. And if you have short-term capital, it forces you into doing things that become suboptimal or not aligned with the company. So long-term capital is super important to us. Yeah, that's good. That's good advice. I would say too, you being very clear on your values. It's interesting, the guests that we have that are successful like you on our show always go back to their values and getting very yeah. clear on your values. Did you know your values when you first started the business? Did you sit and lay them out? Or was that something you developed over time? I think I've known my values uh, for most of my life, which were kind of born out of my near-death experiences. I've had you know numerous near-death experiences, which I won't get into here. Um, but it takes a while to uncover them and articulate them in a way that are digestible to others. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where a lot of the hard work came in is how can you actually create this value system that's actually actionable and digestible by, uh, you know, your team, by your guests or your, you know, community? How can they actually digest and become advocates for what you're trying to do? And Michelle, I know you've always been great at that. Um, mm -hmm. For me, sometimes as I get outward with those ideas, it feels like I'm tuning my own horn a little bit. So I've tried to keep them in and I realized that that's really the wrong thing to do. People enjoy being on that journey and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, helping me. And usually I like to do the helping, but during COVID, I learned that others like helping you just as much. So be open to, uh, you know, receiving help as well. Yeah, I think as entrepreneurs, we always think that we have to do it and it's hard to ask for help. Um, that was another thing that came about was ask for help. Peter Thomas was one of our guests in the past. I know you know Peter. Yeah. He lost $100 million. He was upside down, negative $80 million. And he, he went out and asked for help. And that's what helped turn his business around in his whole career. So asking for help is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, the whole you know financial uh, situation, because financial success after a certain level is a little bit overrated. And we were kind of in that significant stage where we changed, and then you get whipsawed back, get, you know, into it really quickly. So um, it was hard actually not having the um, liquidity and uh, resources to be able to help all those employees around me. And as hard as this was on me, uh, it was much harder on the 7,000 employees that ended up getting, you know, laid off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it was divorce, homelessness, um, unfortunately, even, you know, uh, suicide that came from, mm. you know, all the ramifications um, of some of the decisions that, you know, get made in the short term, which to a logic based, you know, kind of P&L person, mm -hmm. um, you know, seem like the best choice. Right. So 
<clears throat> we do have entrepreneurs that are listening. I want to touch on this for just a second because um, maybe they had a business, you know, that they ended up starting, doing well with. Maybe during COVID they had to shut the doors. They're going out trying to figure it out again, how to get going. And they, you know, we've heard from many of them, some of them are our members that are saying, it's hard for me to go and face people after I've gone through a closure or, a, a fi you know, in their mind, it's a failure. So you've actually, you know, you closed a business, you walked away from it, you've started again. How did you pick up the pieces and move forward? Um, how did you go and present yourself to people? Was it a mental attitude that you just overcame? Um, help some of our viewers listening on how to overcome that. Uh, yeah, I, I was never embarrassed by this. Um, I knew that I didn't cause COVID. And I have something that I probably say ad nauseum, which is doing the right thing only matters when it's hard. And throughout this whole process, I always tried to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised whether it was uh, landlords, uh, vendors, with, with exceptions, um, the majority of them uh, welcomed me with open arms and even kind of leaned over to do even more for me based on the relationship. Um, so I was actually very surprised. I thought that we're going to have to get all new vendor partners. You know, I didn't think that a lot of my uh, previous employees would want to come back because we had to do layoffs. And it was the exact opposite. It's actually been really amazing. And we have deeper relationships of um, uh, partnership whether it's with the teams or with the vendors than we've ever had before, because we've kind of gone through this near-death experience together. Mm -hmm. And by being just totally transparent and honest, that really seemed to make the difference long-term. And uh, it's continuing to uh, pay dividends pretty well. Right, so you've got a lot of employees that came back. As you said, you're, you're working with some theater owners that um, you'd worked with in the past. You've got some um, vendors that you're working with. So what, what, when you say you were transparent, give us some examples of what you would share with people. How far would you go in being transparent? Uh, I started by just creating the container uh, by doing town halls every week. Mm -hmm. So depending on which group it was, um, for all the teams, we did a, a vendor town hall and we literally fielded open questions, gave as many answers as we could, but the frequency where the questions could be asked, really, that, that was the biggest move that actually helped. And then I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations. Like I didn't shy away from talking to the, the landlord when we had to make a change, shying away from uh, talking to the employee who's displaced. And then, you know, even, you know, using some of the resources while they were still available to help employees, you know, at least have some sort of uh, ramp, even though we always wish we could do more, doing the most that you could in the moment based on the circumstances that you had in front of you. So solid, Brian, really solid. Do you mind sharing some yeah. of your values with us? Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, most of uh, my ideas were based at uh, Studio Movie Grill on opening hearts and minds one story at a time. So everything that I did was about opening perspective, creating really a foundational thing. And Michelle, when uh, you and I really started together, um, I would advocate my own personal views. I would use the theaters as a platform to further the ideas that I had. And that quickly evolved into creating a container and a platform for others to exchange ideas, gain perspective, and open up. And it also started with a real focus on logic-based arguments or logic-based content. And then I realized really quickly that the heart was equally as important. So opening your heart allows you to open your mind Mm -hmm. And we would actually curate so many different events um, and help with a formula so people could put on events to really articulate whatever their view was, whatever they really wanted to get across. And so many of those things happened through film, but it was also in current events, sporting events, you name it, bringing people together is what brought me a lot of joy um, and hosting those events. So that was the core pillars. And that really extended out to our team 
where we focused on how could we actually assist them by creating foundational principles that allowed them to live a great life. And that was through our educational uh, platform. That was through our mutual friend, uh, Rand Stegen. We actually instituted all these different educational platforms, even small things, which might seem small to us, which was one of the biggest things for our hourly employee base was financial wellness. How could we help them assess their personal financial wellness and get on a plan to actually manage money? I mean, when when we found out that uh, a lot of our employees were using payday lending at you know twenty five plus percent interest rates, wow, uh, it was just heartbreaking. And whenever something like that would come out in the value and core of the company, we'd say, oh, well, we could actually help solve that for this group. Uh, one of my favorite stories was uh, me getting a little frustrated with one of our general managers because I was looking through my own lens and saying, hey, how come you don't bring your family to the theater? Are you not proud of what we're doing? You know, that was just so foreign to me. I'd never met his family. And he shared with me that he had an autistic child and his child isn't able to come to the movies because they might be disruptive and the, you know, lights and dark thing, um, you know, is upsetting because they were... uh, uh, you know, sensitive or had sensory um, mm-hmm. issues. And I said, oh, okay, that's terrible that, uh, you know, a child isn't able to enjoy movies. What can we do to work around that? And he said, well, we usually turn the lights up and we turn the sound down a little bit. I'm like, well, why don't we do that? And that became our special needs program that was actually picked up by our whole industry. And after years, millions and millions of special needs kids and sensory uh uh, challenge kids have been able to enjoy these programs, and it opens up all kinds of perspectives, both in a social communal gathering place, as well as content. So that's the idea of some of the values that we focused on. So wonderful, Brian. I mean, you, and he really does walk his talk, too. I want to go, this is a great lead-in to conscious capitalism. I mean, you've been involved with conscious capitalism really since the start of that movement started with John Mackey. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about conscious capitalism and how you applied that to your business and how it helped your business? Yeah, so uh, com- conscious capitalism is really based on a stakeholder philosophy where there's not a win-lose, but the combination of actually looking through all your stakeholders and helping them win, you'll actually win and it's an amplifier and a, a force multiplier. So that actually has been true through my whole career. The more I give, the more I get. Now, I don't do it for that reason, but if the investor isn't winning, it's not a good deal. If the community is not winning, it's not a good deal. If your team's not winning, it's not a great deal. And I think it's it's one of the classic mistakes that we make when we're starting the business, where it's really about the founder and it's really about extraction. And if you're able to, especially during this hard time, to give more value, create more value, it ends up coming back to you in spades. It might not be on the exact time frame that you like, but it's a force multiplier. And this simple principle of what we I call win five in our company um, has really been the, the best individual simplified tool that, that we could use. I know it sounds simple, but um, in practice, almost every decision I make is based on what would each stakeholder think about this and how can it be a win for them. And even when I'm in a a basic meeting, I actually go through each person who's attending the meeting and try to inhabit to the extent I can their perspective and think what would they want to get out of this? What are they trying to achieve? And how can I bring my best self to help understand that. Now, luckily, um, you know, having a little bit of the acting background that did, you know, help that and the political background. But if you could try it just once or twice and even practice with a a friend or your spouse or your business partner, try to think through their perspective, Mm -hmm. it does something really beautiful for you. It takes you out of yourself and it starts to widen what you're able to see your field of vision. And I thought, in the hardest times of COVID and the hardest times in my career, one of the best gifts that I've had, and Michelle, you 
won't be surprised that it's a movie oriented uh, <laughs> concept. Um, but what I do is I place myself in the story. And at the darkest part, I remember that the best stories always have a deep, deep depth. And then they have the comeback story or the success. So the hero always goes through that story and being able to put myself on that time uh, line in the story, realizing that it's not the end, but it might be the darkest point, or it actually might be just a point as it continues to go down, but actually pulling myself out of that day to day and having that perspective and then starting to decide what supporting characters do I want in my movie that can help me overcome whatever this challenge is. So I know that sounds a little bit California woo woo, but no, um, I love it's it. actually very practical and helpful to me. Yeah, I love it. Wait, your comment about, you know, the acting and the political, are you bringing those two together, acting and political? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we can all agree that there's a little bit of that. In, yeah. In that, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about your new venture right now. Look, dine in cinemas. Let's talk about that. What you're doing differently. What people can expect when they come into a look cinema, and where can they find look cinemas? Let's let everyone know. Yeah. No. Thanks. Um, uh, surprisingly, uh, we're at uh, eight locations and. We have a nice concentration in Southern California where I grew up. So in Glendale, Redlands, Monrovia, and Downey. Uh, we have a location right here in Dallas um, at uh, 35 and Northwest Highway. Um, we're lovingly calling it uh, Preston Hollow West. And then we have Florida. We're opening next week in Arizona. So we're about to open a theater really every three weeks. And, um, you know, we wow. used to spend a couple of years of planning, but now we're on this a rocket ship, really trying to re-employ the team that I, you know, had before and others that have been displaced with COVID to be able to tell stories and give a community gathering place that uh, really makes a, a difference. But what's different about Look Cinemas from what I did before is right as COVID was going on, I started hearing the same mantra from almost everybody. I can't wait for things to get back to the way that they were. Mm -hmm. And I was never wired like that, that just like, it, literally, it was like, uh, you know, nails on a chalkboard to me, because I said, what a great opportunity to innovate and break down an industry and recreate it. So whether it was working with uh, distribution to try and create new distribution models uh, for theaters and streaming and the entire ecosystem using the stakeholder model, or interviewing a lot of our uh, team members and guests and really learning, okay, what about this dining concept that I love so much keeps more people from wanting to come to it because it really was still a niche type concept. And there was two things that really were just so obvious, but it took COVID to actually help us get to them. We, one was that the guest doesn't like being interrupted during a movie. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> In our core concept, um, delivery of food and beverage and accepting payment was during the climax of the film. So being able to use technology to lean forward, to change that process so all the food's on the table before the film starts and there's no disruptions during the film <laughs> created this proprietary we're calling black box theater concept without distractions that's been a huge differentiator and has been so great for the team and it allows uh our team members to have significantly more um uh uh pay uh because they're able to leverage their uh abilities and they end up making more tips and we can pay them more so for living wages i think that that's been super cool the other thing that our guests told us just definitively is they wanted to control their ordering experience. During the movie, they didn't want to distract other folks, so they wouldn't order that additional beverage, that dessert, or other item. And by being technology uh, enabled with a dim screen that doesn't distract others, they're able to get everything that they need, and our servers can go in a very ninja way without any communication, whatever, to get them what they want. So 
it actually became a much better hospitality experience and limited uh, distraction. And I don't think I would be able to get there in the large organization without something so disruptive. So when you talk about uh, taking out a white piece of paper and trying to, to disrupt yourself and recreate the industry, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I think the uh, Look Cinemas team did really well. Oh, that's so exciting. And I'm so excited to be going back to the theater. So good for you for, for going back out there again. And I'm excited with Look Cinemas. We've got tons of questions that have been coming in, Brian. So I wanna get to some of the questions from our guests. Um, and from our viewers. So we've got, let's just start with Steve as our first question. Um, how is your new business, well, you just said, it, I think this just answered. He asked the question, how is your new business model different from the old business model? And I think you just mentioned a few of those. Are there anything, is there anything else on the business model? Yeah, so the, the guest really wants control and control in a lot of different ways. So we went ahead and there's a, a food and beverage aspect. So we went with the white piece of paper there. So now everything's fresh made to order. We looked at sourcing, but we're adding these geo tags on the uh, technology where if you're uh, vegan oriented or if you have dietary restrictions or you want something uh, that's of a certain you know, type of food, you're actually able to just search through, but more importantly, you're being able to recreate the menu in various different ways mm -hmm. with the ingredients that we already have to curate it to yourself so there's no veto vote and you can get what you want. This idea of actually being able to control your own experience, I think is really powerful, really for the entire industry uh, as far as restaurants go. Mm -hmm. And then for mov movie theaters on that side, being able to control your experience by inserting technology so that you can actually watch content that's not Hollywood film by renting out an auditorium. Mm -hmm. You can actually come, and if you want to binge watch, you know, your uh, different shows, if you want to watch a sporting event, um, what's become really part, uh, popular lately is uh, e-gaming. Mm -hmm. If you want to do that with a group of friends, it's really easy now technologically to stream that right in. So instead of fighting against streaming, We've just fully embraced it and integrated it into the model. Ah, you're so smart. Okay, so Alan is asking the question, from your perspective, what are all the reasons that companies are having a challenge finding lower pay and entry-level positions? Yeah, there are a lot of challenges with that. I need to knock on wood. I haven't had a lot of those challenges. And one of the reasons I think that is, is a lot of my uh, team members that we'd invested in came back. But the other reason is we've continued to try and curate the training and experience and requirements that we'll take first time employees and we'll, we'll teach them. A matter of fact, sometimes it's better to be able to teach our philosophy and our core systems. So if you're having trouble getting your uh, entry level or your employee base, you might wanna focus on uh, what kind of training you have and how difficult it is for an individual to do their job. And I think mastery of understanding is when you can explain it in a quick and efficient way. So simplifying that process so you can get uh, your team up to speed has kind of been the key to that. I think also the way that you value your employees, it's known out there, Brian, so people want to work with you and work for you. Yeah. I think that's another key ingredient. So we've got a question from Julie, and it's about conscious capitalism. She said, from a conscious capital perspective, how are service industries going to change their business models so they can afford to provide market competitive jobs and attract and retain good employees? Well, I can't speak for the entire industry, but technology has actually been really helpful to create more efficiencies. But this all goes back to all of our businesses having a trade of value for services. So what kind of value can you bring? And I've found the more that I focus on giving more to the employees, it comes back. I've never ascribed to the idea of minimum wages. I've always supported living wages. And how do you create a living wage? Well, it's different in each city. But if we have the right employees doing the right thing, they are the tip of the spear. 
And that always comes back in hospitality, retention, more sales. So um, in those industries, I've never bought into that um, idea that if you have to pay a little bit more, that it kills your profit. But I know I'm a contrarian there. So I get myself into trouble when I'm at industry events sometimes. <laughs> okay, here's a question from Charlie, who's out on Facebook. He's asking the question, what were the things required in the restructuring process that were incompatible with your beliefs? Yeah, I have some limitations on how far I can, uh, you know, go with those things. But uh, thanks for that question. Um, it, it's really the idea of extraction. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you one of the stories. I was on a um, conference call and <laughs> I was, you know, I, I do kind of weird little things when I'm on some of those calls to distract myself. But there was 26 professionals on the call. Uh, average pay, and remember, this is a, a company, uh, you know, that is really struggling that has no revenue coming in. So the average comp for these professionals would say, you know, maybe six, seven hundred dollars an hour times twenty six. I was calculating how much it would be in the twenty minutes that we spent scheduling the next call, <laughs> which was to be about how we could um, lower the pay to the employees. Wow. And it turned out those two meetings actually could have covered uh, a month of those expenses. Wow. So it's it's how, it, you know, it's just how rewards a little bit get out of whack. And clearly, you know, it's not popular with the professionals when you bring that up. But what does our society value in this world? Do we value our employees that are actually doing the hard work at the tip of the spear, or do we only value those that have these Ivy League or professional educations? What kind of society do we want to have? And can we value the entire chain of individuals or just the people at the top? Do the bottom really exist to serve the top? Or are we all in this together as an ecosystem? And I would just challenge everybody to think about a couple of those things. and. With all that seeming altruistic, mm -hmm. it's also the very, very most profitable thing that you could do selfishly. Interesting. What a great answer. Charlie, hopefully that helps you. Um, Chanel's asking the question, I've always been interested in the public-facing end of the movie business. Can you share with us what percent of profit does showing the movies represent versus things like the concession sales? Uh, yes. Um, so uh, we share uh, revenue with the studios. Um, so, you know, if you would call it a 50-50 split on the uh, movie tickets, uh, that's kind of that split. Um, so the way that most in the industry think about it is that the movie tickets are there to cover all your fixed expenses, and then the concessions cover all the variable um, expenses and where all the profitability is. So it's really not one or the other. It's an ecosystem, but uh, that's usually how the profits uh, kind of spread out. Interesting. Okay. I've always wondered about that too. Sheila has a question <clears throat> and um, you answered it earlier, but I'm going to take it a step further because she's asking about creating a special space for autistic children in the theater. Are you now doing that with Look Cinema? Uh, we're just starting, so we have limited hours, um, but that's actually going to be coming out for this holiday season. So um, it's a process. I want everything over, but that's one of the most gratifying and important programs that we have, as well as serving uh, inner city youth. And all these programs are just starting to come on, and each manager will turn those on as they're ready for it, as they build that capacity. And just to give you context, um, we're nine weeks into this journey. Right. So, so it's amazing. It's You've very, already got eight it, It's theaters. very new. So these things are, are brand new. But uh, uh, these are these are critical uh, programs. And more and more, especially for the um, uh, employee teams, mm -hmm. we, we have to do something that matters. We've reflected for a year and a half on what matters in our life. And I, I just don't think our workforces are going to want to come out and do something that's meaningless. 
You're such a breath of fresh air, Brian. It's so wonderful to have you here. Okay, so Joseph has an interesting question. He's asking, what's the name of the movie star that plays Brian Schultz? <laughs> Who plays you? And what's the theme song of that movie? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So um, you've said this before, Michelle, you would probably pick Nicolas Cage, but I, I'm going to go with Bradley Cooper uh, aspirationally when I'm at my best. So. <laughs> I don't know if I ever said Nicholas Cage. <laughs> okay, so we've got tons of questions that are continuing to come through, but we're now going to go over to the VIP room. And Brian, you've got a button that's going to come up, a link that you're, click, you'll click it. Don't click it yet, but you'll click that link to go over to the VIP room. And Jay, our executive VP, will be in there, Jay Fairbrother, that will, and he'll help facilitate and carry on that conversation with our premium members. Um, Jay, just so you know, was an EOer with all of us, and um, right. it started out when we all started out, and he's, uh, he's now on board with GLOW, helping us grow GLOW, so we're excited about that. But Brian, this has been so fun. We've known each other for so long. It's been a lot of fun sharing this time with you. Thank you for coming on Likewise. board with us. Appreciate Likewise. it. Likewise. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. So um, you want to make sure that you tune in next week. Brian, we'll, we'll see you around, and um, uh, you'll, you'll see something from me uh, via email. All right? Thank you. All right. Thank you, and I'll let you guys go on over into the VIP room with Brian, carry on the conversation for all of our premium members with Brian Schultz. Um, it's not recorded, so... They'll get to share some additional information with one another. I'm going to stick around. I'm going to answer some questions that you might have about GLOW or the Business Finishing School. Maybe talk to you about our event that we have coming up in March where we've got some fabulous speakers that are going to be coming in and spending two and a half days with us and, um, and tell you a little bit about our award ceremony where we're going to select the top 50 business leaders from around the world. Uh, and they're going to have a tremendous amount of publicity and PR that goes behind it. So we're hoping you as a business leader will submit an application um, and look at nominating yourself to becoming one of the recognized business leaders of 2021. So I'm okay. here. Isn't I'll answer any fantastic? questions you might have. You bet. Can you hear me, Michelle? Yeah, I can How hear you. you? That okay. was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing, Brian, with us. Um, I know so many of these speakers are good friends of yours, and I feel like we get to just eavesdrop on um, your personal networking events. It's fantastic. I, I really appreciate it. Could you share with the folks who are still on and are listening, what, what is the value proposition for joining GLOW at yeah. that premium level? So as a premium member, which... Um, you know, first off, let's just back off. So GLOW is really built for the entrepreneur because number one, it's really lonely at the top as the CEO, the owner, the one running the business. It's lonely. You need a group, a community to be able to go to and talk to and share ideas with. So number one, it's about the community. Um, that's one of the benefits of joining GLOW. The other benefit is the commerce component. So you're in business to actually grow your business. And how do you do that? By transacting new business with other people. Glow helps you facilitate that capability. So we've got a marketplace and you can promote and advertise your company's products and services as many times as often as you would like as a premium member of Glow. The other thing that we've got is the capital component. So if you're looking to raise capital within the next six months, whether it be equity or debt, GLOW can assist you in finding that right capital. So you want to make sure that you come on board for GLOW. Um, and, and for people that, you know, might not really be thinking about raising capital, there's also the content capability. So we've got content, just like you're experiencing this week, we've got that coming to you every week. But we also have your chapters where you're receiving content at the chapter level. And then we've got the Business Finishing School that as a GLOW member, you get a discounted rate on um, the Business Finishing School program. And that is such a great program. I'm a seasoned entrepreneur. I've been going through the program myself. I've learned new things. I've been reminded of things that I should be doing that I'm not. Um, and it's really helping me with my business. Um, so we're hoping that uh, as an entrepreneur, you would come on and take the Business Finishing School, receive your discount, becoming a GLOW member, you get a discount to take the Business Finishing School. And um, yeah, so. That, that's how, those are the benefits. Those four C's is what we really, those are our pillars, Joseph. 
community, yeah, commerce, so one capital, of the other um, things um, is the um, is the chapters, and I know that you mentioned it a little bit, but could could you talk about how excited? Um, I guess how excited we are that the chapters are beginning to meet again and, yes. and what happens at a chapter meeting. Absolutely. Why it, why it adds so much value. <laughs> so chapter events really allow you to get to meet the other local decision makers in your city. So if you're looking, if you're thinking, you know, my network isn't really where it should be, I should really have a larger network of other decision makers and I need to grow that network, that's what GLOW is about. And so you as a business leader can join a chapter, attend your monthly events. So every month the chapters are now, just as Joseph said, starting to get, get together and have face-to-face -face meetings. They bring in an educational component to it by bringing in a speaker. Some of the speakers maybe you've seen here on our show in the past might come in person. Um, it allows you to have the networking, the peer-to-peer -peer networking. And, uh, you know, it's usually only an hour and a half, two hours out of your uh, a day once a month. So, um, and wait, I want to say one more thing. So if you join, if you're one of the first 50 members of your chapter, you become a member of the founding 50. And every chapter has this, the founding 50. And in that founding 50, you get all sorts of um, opportunities and discounts. So if you're one of the first 50 to join a chapter, you get discounts to our global event that we're having in March. You get discounts to the Business Finishing School. You get access into the um, uh, IQ, uh, uh, the, um, the capital component. Um, you get uh, the collective IQ. I was trying to remember what it was called, a collective IQ. There are lots of different benefits that you get. You get the toolbox. You get all sorts of bennies inside the toolbox of GLOW. And as a founding 50, you get this whole list of things um, that others will not get, and you'll have that for the life of your membership. So um, you keep hinting at it, but now it's time. Tell us about what's happening in March. Yes. Yeah, so in March, we're having the first inaugural Leaders 50 event. Leaders 50 event is a two and a half day program that's going to be in Dallas, Texas between March 3rd and March 6th. And we're so excited about it. We've already got speakers that we're signing up that um, are going to be coming in. We've got Kevin Harrington that's going to be coming in and he's going to be doing a pitch off with some other judges. So you'll have the opportunity to come and pitch Kevin if you'd like. Um, he's going to be speaking about what he likes in a pitch and what makes a good pitch. We're going to have... Um, Vince Pacenti, who will be there right after the release of his new book, The Earthquake, which is a great book about when, when the rug gets pulled out from underneath you, what do you do to get back up? It's called The Earthquake, Vince Pacenti. We've got Ford Sakes coming in. He's going to have people in a hot seat reviewing their marketing and saying, you should be doing this. Maybe this could be done differently. So you're going to have an expert really giving advice, on real-time real advice on marketing uh, concepts and ideas. We've got so much content coming at you, but we also have uh, the Leaders 50 inaugural gala. And what is that? That's where you as a CEO can nominate yourself or someone in your company can nominate you as well. Uh, we're going to be looking at business leaders that meet the criteria of just really similar to Brian, actually. Like, what did you do for your employees during COVID times? How did you treat your employees? What did you do with your vendors? And how did you treat your vendors and your customers? What innovative ideas did you bring about due to COVID? So we're going to be looking at that for the top 50 business leaders in 2021. And they're going to be recognized. They're going to be recognized and awarded that evening, the Leaders 50 Gala. We're going to have a lot of press there that's going to be reporting on it. And um, doesn't matter how big or small your company is, we're looking at business leaders that are doing the right thing and how they're being innovative um, on leading their business. So we hope that as you as a CEO, or if you're listening um, and you're not the CEO, but you want to nominate your CEO, that you ab absolutely do that. So Leaders 50. Sounds, sounds fantastic, Michelle. So we are right at the end of our time right? um, here in the Q&A. Um, what's coming up? What, what can folks look forward to this month? So this month we've got we've got Dr. Pat Pearsall who will be here talking about sabotaging. So she's going to be on. Um, I think she's here in two weeks. Actually, we've got a surprise guest next week that you need to be tuning into. Um, we'll be promoting. We'll actually be starting to promote that today. Our next guest, 
Uh, and Pat's here in two weeks, but it'll be interesting to hear from her. She's a psychiatrist by training and works with CEOs on how they've been sabotaging their business career. So that'll be an interesting conversation. And, um, you know, really that, that Leaders 50 Gala and the March 3rd through the 6th event is what I'm most excited about, Joseph. And the Business Finishing School. You know, the Business Finishing School will be a component of the Leaders 50 event also. And yeah. for those that are interested in learning more about the Business Finishing School, it's businessfinishingschool.com, and you can go on there today and sign up for it and help your company mm -hmm. become more profitable, scalable, sustainable, and saleable. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you, everybody, who visited us today. Yeah, thank you, Joseph. Appreciate everyone. Until next week, next Thursday, 10 a.m. Central Time, um, stay safe and God bless.